Good morning, Party Track. How are we doing? Yeah! Yeah! All right. How many people here came to hear about home alarm systems? All right. You're not going to hear about home alarm systems. Oh, sorry. Um, the speaker had a, uh, had a small problem with his employer. So uh, that talk is not going to happen. But I can guess, and I'll summarize it, even though I haven't read the talk, um, your home alarm system is kind of fucked. <laughs> all good right, job, job. all right, yeah! yeah! So, with that out of the way, well, let's figure out a bonus talk then, right? Um, so this is my good friend, Zach. We go back a long way, and uh, he's going to give you the most entertaining and exciting talk about logs that you're going to see all day. So... Yeah! Let's give Zach a big party track welcome. It's the most exciting one because there's no other one. Uh, but so before we get started, um, as Juris was saying, this is Logan. Everyone say hi, Logan. He was the one who was originally supposed to speak at this slot about, you know, the insecurities in home alarm systems. And you may have seen a few articles, you know, hit up on a few different sites about his talk, but uh, last week this article came out and it sounds like that he had to cancel, ergo why I'm here. More recently, NPR actually did an article. Uh, they actually got time with him. I pinged him a few times to see if he, you know, wanted to actually share some information that he could share but didn't respond, so I just want to post this NPR article real quick because that summarizes pretty much what happened. He was supposed to be on stage, but because of the pressures put on him, he can't. So I'm just going to leave those names up there for a second. <laughs> and we're moving on. So in honor of Logan, because he couldn't make it, I decided to start our new meme, Ridiculously Good Looking Researcher. <laughs> Has to pull talk, still impresses us all with his smile. <sighs> and this is your top gear, top tip. If you're gonna do this and get your talk pulled, uh, pro tip number one, follow responsible disclosure if you're feeling nice. Tip number two, don't name the vendor in a press release unless your goal is to get your talk pulled. See you too. And if you're going to give the talk, you know, and you're worried about legal action, go ahead and obfuscate and make sure you sell the job. So top gear, top tip, if you're going to do what Logan did for the future, for those of you who may be considering, I don't know, doing his talk in a, or a similar talk in a future venue, you might want to follow that. But so instead you get me, logging by Zach. This is party track, isn't it? Good. So I always like to start the talks off with what this talk is and what this talk is not so you don't have to spend the next 45 minutes listening to me ramble. So first and foremost, this is going to be a defense focused talk. So if you're looking for some sexy O-Day, you're not going to find it here. Uh, we're going to be talking about collecting, storing, monitoring, parsing, fun, having fun with logs. And we're going to try to make it fun. And the big reason I'm giving this is because it's a reoccurring problem we keep having over and over and over. We're not getting good logging systems put together. We're not getting good logging data in most situations. Sure, you may be the 1% here who's like, yeah, I got this shit covered. This talk is not for you. Um, and if you know what ELK stands for and you are an ELK rock star, you may want to go get a few minutes elsewhere. But this is going to be probably a 200, 300 level talk on logging and big logging environments. So as I said, this is not a talk about hacking your alarm systems and the wireless problems with them. This is not an offensive security talk and I'm not going to be addressing challenges of dealing with over 200 gigs of log data a day. That's going to be a whole different, you know, barrel of monkeys to deal with. So who am I? My name's Zach, as we've already covered. I'm a magic partner over at Urbane. I hail from Chicago. I do things in stuff. And everyone has their big slide of credentials. This is mine. <laughs> Moving on. So let's face it, you know, offensive talks can get up here and ramble about the cool hotness for a full hour about how awesome things are. But really, 
we're not going to use a lot of that stuff. Yeah, it's cool to hear about, you know, the insecurities and this and that, but when we come back to our day jobs back at home, we've actually got to deal with protecting stuff. So the vast majority of us actually need more defensive talks. I figured I would take and make it my initiative to start looking a little more on the defensive side. So let's start with logging. I'm going to say it with an Irish or Boston accent. I don't know. So we still have a logging problem. We're still relying on log data and log formats that are archaic. And we've seen, you know, from me and my consulting role and from a lot of other people, we've seen that, you know, the tech community has this figured out, but not from a security perspective. You know, their focus has been on, you know, we want to know if there's errors, you know, we want to know what user habits are. Uh, but InfoSec hasn't really figured it out. I don't know if it's because we're lazy or because we haven't taken the time to look at it, but I figured let's dive into it a little bit more. So kind of what we're going to cover today, we're not going to talk about generating logs because that's easy. I could give you a configuration file and we could call it a day. I'm not going to fill 45 minutes of explaining a config file. It'll put you all to sleep, even if there's music here at Party Track. We're going to talk more about the collecting the logs. We're going to talk about storing, processing, and most importantly, the actual monitoring and security events for logs. Here's the obligatory, why do we need logs? Because, oh, I'm just storing them. It, it goes beyond just security. You know, we need it just from a management perspective to convince our bosses that this is, we're doing what we're doing and we're doing it right. A lot of times we have to deal with this compliance stuff. <sighs> Full disclosure, I'm a QSA now and it, I cannot say anything about it. So, <laughs> it's not out of choice. Uh, so, Long story short, yeah, compliance is going to be a driving force a lot of times for stuff. And we can use that also from a security point of view of going, hey, I got to meet this ISO, PCI, HIPAA, whatever it may be, whatever you have to deal with. We can use that to say, hey, I need a little money, I need a little time to actually do the cool security stuff I want to do. Um, we need it from the security mining perspective, duh. For instance, response, duh. And from a technical operations side, as I said, DevOps has this figured out. They've got to figure it out from, you know, we need this from an operational side. But they don't really share that information sometimes or we don't have a DevOps kind of thing. And I'm using DevOps loosely if people don't know what it is. It's the whole integration of developers with operational people and being one big happy family. Um, and let's be honest about our current state of logs. Um, most stuff just kind of sits there or gets deleted. You know, we have our <laughs> log rotate set for 90 days because we have to for compliance reasons and it's getting deleted. Or we're sending it to some product that's magically this pretty little box or pretty little VM or pretty little software and we're storing it and when, you know, we're having people come in to troubleshoot something or having that auditor or assessor come in, we're showing it to them. But honestly, we're, let's be honest with ourselves and confess right now, we're not really watching them as much as we should in most cases. You know, we've set it up because we thought we were doing the right thing, but we don't actually watch them. And I think a lot of that comes from the usual approach of watching logs. As you can tell, by the way, I love the TV show Archer. So all these images that don't have attribution, you can take them. Um, but so the traditional approach of using, you know, a syslog server and using regex and grep and awk and sending alerts if it hits a certain thing, it, it doesn't really scale well. You know, we can take and set it up for multiple systems and back up, but it really defeats the purpose of being able to search and actually leverage those. And again, as I said, we can leverage a vendor product. So a lot of good vendors, I won't name names here, you can, uh, but a lot of them have great products out there, but they are expensive as shit. And the whole model is to do it as a volume based licensing. You want to log more? It's going to cost you more but I'm hosting my own data. It's going to cost you more. And yeah, it makes sense from a business standpoint and it makes sense from a scale standpoint, but it can get very expensive quickly. I was talking to a friend the other day and they had a $2 million IT budget for all their operational expenses. They had a large vendor, we'll call him, call them a flog him him. Uh, and they wanted $400,000 to do the logging for their environment. I mean, that's almost 25% of their year's budget just to do logs? I mean, we can use our money a little bit more wisely and I'm not saying, you know, vendors are a bad thing. Don't, if you work for a vendor, a lot of you probably do, I'm not saying, oh, don't go buy the big guy's data. It's great a lot of times. If you have the financial resources, they are definitely great. And they offer, offer most importantly, the idea of not being, have to have the technical talent to manage them. 
You can hire the guy who just graduated from college, say, here, have fun with this product, and they'll figure it out. But we can be a little bit smarter since we're people who actually like to tinker with things, break things, and do things right. So I've been on this journey to find open source solutions and to actually help share the, the open source solutions that are out there and how to configure them. And so I looked for this logging, or scalable logging solution that's you know, open source so we can tinker with it and we don't have to pay licensure fees. It's reliable, scalable, secure, and the reliable and scalable is really important when it comes to your logs and meets the compliance requirement stuff that you have to follow. And here are our top three winners. We've got Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana, which is what I'll be talking about today, also known as Elk. As a runner-up, we have FluentD, which leverages Elasticsearch. They're a great product, or, or a great solution. I don't want to call them a product because they don't really sell it. And then there's Greylog2 as well. Now, as you can tell, Logstash and Greylog are Java-based. I know, boo, hiss, Java, so memory consumption, but they work. Uh, and then FluentD is CRuby based, so Ruby. So as I said, we'll be focusing on Logstash, kind of going through what is this Logstash, Elasticsearch, Kibana stuff, and how do we get events, process them, alert them, search them, and most importantly, impress that boss, because that's what we're doing. And so that's the end of my talk. Um, you should just go use it, and we're done. More or less my water break. So the biggest pains for logging, as a lot of us have faced, is that we're getting a lot of log data from a bunch of different sources that come in all these different formats and all these different date stamp or timestamp formats and sometimes they're this, sometimes they're that and we've got to parse them, we've got to actually make sure we have the accurate time for them. And so Elasticsearch or the Logstash processor actually tries to do that. And so this is a look as to how Logstash processes its data. So from a shipper perspective, that's kind of your syslog agents, your um, log stash agents that are basically generating those logs and sending it to a central source. You have a broker which basically queues everything up so it can process it as fast as possible and distribute that job across. You have an indexer that looks at it, does the analysis of what is this log, how do I parse it, how do I tag it, and where do I ship it, and sends it off to search and storage, and then you got the pretty little web interface to actually monitor everything. This sounds kind of familiar to a lot of other products out there. But the cool thing with Elasticsearch and with Logstash is that you can scale it. So instead of just having one system, you know, you may be logging 10 gigs of data a day and then next week you've got to log 100. You know, obviously the whole title of the talk is log all the things. You know, I, I'll start on the ramble about generating logs later but the more data we have, the more we can actually do actionable intelligence for it. So to scale it up, all you have to do is take those little individual parts and split them across more systems. So you can take and split the broker across multiple systems to queue everything up and have a little more redundancy. You can take the log stash indexer and split it up across multiple systems to actually process those logs. And then your Elasticsearch cluster obviously could grow as well for the storage and the searching. So as I previously said, we're going to focus on really the aspects of collecting and shipping logs, storing logs, processing, monitoring them, and searching them. But obviously there's that generating log component as well. So First things first, the biggest reason a lot of us don't generate the logs we need to is because we're using some commercial product and paying based upon how much we generate. That doesn't really work well for security and for event monitoring because you're starting to get in that case of picking and choosing before you get the intel. So my theory is we should build something that we can collect all the logs we want and the only cost to us is more disk space and more processing power, which is now relatively cheap compared to other things. So in order to collect the logs, Logstash has this thing called inputs. And so we can use our traditional syslog that everyone is, has fun and familiar with, the archaic syslog of text. We can also leverage Logstash's agent Lumberjack, which is a thinner version that actually can do the parsing of the data on the clients. And we can also do time queries as inputs, and I'll touch on that in a second. So going through kind of the different systems you typically have to face for your your Linux, Unix, and Mac logs, obviously you can leverage syslog agents, just as is, and send that data to Logstash. Or you can also leverage uh, the Logstash agent, which is Java-based. Now obviously you have to do that trade-off of do I want to install Java or do I want to just send it with syslog? Syslog. 
<laughs> so it also supports TLS as well. So for those of you who are like, oh, UDP, syslog, it'll lose stuff, it's not encrypted, it does support TCP and TLS. So the good old Windows logs that everyone has the hiccup on and everyone's making their money off of because there's no good solution out there for Windows logging agents. Um, you're able to do it with obviously Windows uh, log slash agent. Again, you'll be installing Java on systems. Or there are syslog agents that are available open source free uh, and community editions of them online. So nxlog is a great one that basically takes whatever you're sending it, files or Windows event logs, sends it off to syslog. And same thing for Snare's open source edition. Now both of these agents, nxlog and Snare have commercial versions so before you go Zach, they have a paid version. They also have an open source community edition. It just doesn't have as much pretties. And then obviously the third option for those of you who are banging your head about Windows logs and how do you deploy this across your environment is to just use Windows built in event collector. Using Windows event collector and one Windows system to kind of collect all those logs, use that central event collector system to parse the logs and then ship them off over syslog. That way you can easily deploy it with a group policy and not have to worry about installing software on all your production systems. And then obviously the device logs, your network devices, your storage devices, your traditional syslog works well but what's one of the cool things about Logstash is it also offers SNMP traps as well. So you're able to just send SNMP traps to it and it's able to parse that and push it into the logging complex. You can also send raw socket data and it'll be able to parse whatever it has coming in and then able to make exec calls which I'll touch on in a second. But most importantly, a lot of times we focus on just the operating system logs uh, and the application logs that get fed into the syslog complex. But one of the biggest things we miss is these application logs. So we need to log more than just, you know, the default, hey, I requested this page, moving on. Leveraging web app logs and integrating into the web app code with your development team to generate, hey, I saw a password change, this seems weird, oh, we just got a bunch of sessions that didn't exist, send something into the main logging complex. It creates a single source for, your, for you and the rest of the security teams out there to kind of monitor everything instead of having all these different aspects to pull. And obviously you, you can generate from those applications the usual text files depending upon what application you're using, fire an event and syslog or use redis to queue up the logs and pretty much anything. One of the nice things about Logstash is the ability to pull from any source and write your own plugins. That's a, that would be a whole different talk for a whole other day so we won't get too far deep in there but it's an option. So what about the cloud? Well, I hate saying that name. <laughs> We're gonna drink every time I say the cloud. Um, so what about the cloud? Cyber, cyber, cyber. If you're playing at home, <laughs> I don't see many people playing at home. Is it, it's afternoon, yes. So more and more providers in, who are offering cloud infrastructures and a lot of more people are moving to these cloud infrastructures are offering the ability to grab the audit logs without having to do a formal request. So a lot of people aren't monitoring this. You know, recently, um, I'm trying to remember the name, uh, Code, someone fill me in, that had their AWS instances completely. Code Thank you, Code Spaces. Codespaces recently had went under an AWS attack and yes we can argue over how their infrastructure was actually set up that they should have had their backups in a whole different environment that wasn't AWS. Whole other talk, whole other day. But we aren't monitoring those logs there. We're pushing all of our emails, not we all but a lot of places are pushing these logs and this data out everywhere and not monitoring it. We're not monitoring who's logging into our Google Apps account. You know, someone could be sitting there for months or logging in from some other geolocation that doesn't normally log into. No one's checking AWS to see who's got our API key that may have accidentally ended up somewhere. Something seems weird. So some of these services have started offering the ability to actually take and grab these logs from AWS, Google Apps, Box, Salesforce, but others aren't yet. So these are kind of a, a top gear, top tip of different options for logging if you want to start pulling logs from these cloud services. So AWS has CloudTrail. Oh, thank you. The gentleman is keeping me honest. Thank you, sir. AWS has mm, Trail, which basically takes event logs every five minutes and pushes them into an S3 bucket. Logstash is able to pull those S3 buckets and parse those logs. 
Google Apps has their reports API, which is basically an API you can make queries against. Box has their events API. And Salesforce has login history now. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Office 365 currently doesn't offer any kind of live parsing. You can request them, but that doesn't help you with monitoring it. Dropbox, same thing. You can see it through their dashboard, but you can't have any kind of API access to it. And GitHub, I have yet to find any kind of logging other than enterprise. And more and more people, for some reason, think it's a good idea to push all your enterprise code into GitHub. I love GitHub, don't get me wrong, but I think it's kind of a bad idea to push everything out there. But, so as I said, Logstash can pull from these from either an exec or from a built-in input. Now you'd be like, okay, you're talking about all these inputs, what are they? This is a list of the current version of inputs. And there's a lot that are, we'll call them alpha. Um, and we'll touch on that later, but there's a lot that have been established, tested, and well rounded. So, as I said, you have exec. Exec will let you run any kind of shell script, any kind of Ruby script, any kind of command whatsoever, take whatever the output is, and send it into the logging infrastructure. So, you can customize exactly how you want to get that log data. You know, if you don't have a traditional source of data, you can start querying other APIs. And in fact, you may see also on that list, there's a Twitter plugin. You can have it monitor the Twitter stream for mentions of something, hashtags, whatever, and put that into your logging complex. I think that's pretty cool. Um, that you're able to be like, oh, create a security event, somebody just doc drop this. So, and as I said, it's got the S3 input, it's got exec, and it's got a few other things in there, uh, and the SNMP trap as well. So those are the different um, inputs. So as I said, traditional inputs you can still use the um, syslog to collect the events um, and Redis and all those other agents. But the idea is then, do you really trust this somewhat young product? Uh, by the way, I didn't mention Logstash is now a part of Elasticsearch and their whole parent family, so they have commercial support behind them. But do you really trust this new Java-based application with your, all your logs all the time? Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're one of those people who live on the wild side like me, you can send it straight to Logstash and just be like, here, have fun. But you can also take and build a logging complex where you're able to par send these logs and parse these logs in different ways. So my recommendation is always, if you don't really trust it, um, you can always build up an R syslog or a syslog ng layer of basically send the logs to the syslog system first, then send it to Logstash, and then also send it to Hadoop for storage or store it, send it traditional files for storage. So you still have that retention, and you still have that logs being archived elsewhere, but you also have all the cool new pretties that Logstash offers. Um, so once Logstash has all these events, what do you do with them? Uh, Regex kind of is awesome and sucks at the same time. Uh, it's awesome because you can do anything with it. It sucks because you can do anything with it and you have to learn how to do anything with it. So Logstash has decided to create this thing called, uh, this parsing engine called Grok. It still supports regex, it still supports uh, traditional grep statements, but Grok is pretty awesome as it simplifies not having to know regex. They have pre-built all these different syntaxes in here, and I'll go through examples in a second. Um, this is just probably 10% of them. But if you want to map an IP address, a username, um, a log status level, you're able to do that with just saying what the uh, syntax is. So you would just say, word or data. It makes life easy. So even those who are not super technical with regex are able to write a pattern this quickly to parse Apache logs. And this is really it. I mean, as soon as you send, get an input, obviously you need to have the input in there too, but this is it for the filter. Combine Apache log, done. It parses it, happy days. What about more complex data? Stuff that doesn't really fit in, fit in existing syntax. Let's take this as an example. We have a typical PAM notification. This is raw syslog data that I generated August 8th. You do the math. Uh, basically, your typical, hey, PAM detected someone log in. Now this may look a little complicated, but really I'm doing two levels of parsing here. And this is an actual working config and I'll be posting more later, but um, this is all you have to do in order to parse it. First we parse to see, is it a PAM message? So we look for the PAM Unix flag. Say grab all the data, pick what mo or, uh, module, pick what phase it's coming from, is it authentication, is it authorization? And then once you tag it, you know, as you can see in there, there's those add tags, add tag for PAM, add tag for login, so you can do filtering and monitoring for it. 
Once you tag it with that, you can easily then say, all right, well, let me grab all the other data out of it. I want to grab the user, I want to grab the session ID, I want to grab the remote host. And that's it for the regex, and it gets parsed. And you're able to take, and here's a quick from uh, Elasticsearch of it parsing into all the different fields. And without having to know all this crazy regex to figure out, oh, well, we, we got a missing case here, you're able to quickly say, all right, grab the data, put it into this format, and it's pretty easy to figure out how to start parsing and filtering your logs. But that's not all the filters it has on the way in. We can tag metrics with it. We can track to see, all right, let's grab everything that has a failed login and start assigning a metric to it and know how many failed logins we have for this IP or this user over a one minute, five minute, 15 minute, one hour window. We can get GUI IP information in it with the filters as well. Those pretty graphs that, like I was saying, your bosses love. I don't know why people love seeing that we have a bunch of attacks coming from this other country. Did they get in? No, but we have a bunch of attacks. <laughs> You're on the internet, bro. Like, but management for some reason loves that. So you can give them those pretty little graphs. You can do GUIP tagging and pull from the GUIP databases. You can do reverse DNS lookups to be able to make your matches easier if you have a dynamic environment or just want to start logging that data. And then there's URL decode, so you can take a decode if you have a URL inside of a URL. You can do multi-line data, so if it crosses more than one line. You can do key values, so if it's a situation as you saw in the previous one of our host equals, action equals, you can just say key value it and it parses all that out automatically. And the coolest thing is it can do anonymize. So if you happen to not be here in the US and have to not store data of people, uh, you can anonymize that data as soon as it comes in with random data, hash data, however you can take and sanitize that. So for those of you who have to deal with European laws or other laws that say you can't actually store this after so long, it's a great option. So after you filter all that data, Logstash then can output it to pretty much anywhere. Traditionally people will send it to Elasticsearch for monitoring and searching and that's what we're going to cover next. Um, but you can send it to different indexes just like you can with other large logging products. You can also do what's really cool is called exec. So with exec, as soon, if you see a certain set of flags or you far, parse it out and filter it out, you can take and go, oh, this looks interesting. I wanted to do something every time I see this. But I don't want an email. I wanted to, I don't know, automatically block something. You can just make an exec call to whatever script and I'll touch on some cool things later. If you're like me and you don't want to keep changing your filters and want to dynamically change how things are, you can make a web, just a simple web call to some other monitoring app that you wrote and say, hey, I saw a bunch of odd things or I saw a login from this IP. Do something with that. And write up a web app to, instead of having to script and write all this stuff and keep restarting your uh, filters, you can just say, send all this login information to this other web source and tell me if I should generate any kind of alerts. If you're someone who sits on chat all day, you can send it as into your chat logs. I don't think there's an IRC output, which I was kind of disappointed in. Um, if you're a user of PagerDuty, you can send it there, or your traditional email notifications that go in that bucket you never monitor. So, <clears throat> as I was saying, you can filter, you can parse, you can do all this fun stuff. What do we care about? You know, we're sending it to this place and we're not monitoring. As I said, the biggest important thing is for us to actually monitor these security events. So as I was saying, we set up filters to parse the stuff, we tag them, saying this is a security event, this is a compliance event, this is uh, a fail login, success login. We can create all the tags you want. Add metrics if you want to see if there's too many failed logins over a certain window. You pick the output and then you can scale. So here are two simple outputs that I wrote together real fast that shows if it's a failed login and it's been over two for this specific user in within a minute, send me an email. That's how simple it is. If you want to send it, like I like was saying, all the auth requests, you want to send it to some other source to dynamically determine, hey, I wrote this cool little PHP app that'll tell me if you send it the IP and the username, it'll determine if it's new. If you're more comfortable with some other language, Ruby, whatever, send it there you can start sending these kind of actions elsewhere that traditional logging complexes can't do. Yes, some commercial products support this as well, but this one's free. So in the second example, obviously, anytime there's an auth request that's tagged as an auth request after we do all those filters, send it to whatever. That's not actually real, so don't go trying to query that. You're not going to get anything. Uh, and send it a post. 
So this is what I'm saying. We can do these execs. We can do these remote calls. You know, as a security people, this is awesome. We can have it do whatever we want when automatically. We can have it update. Again, this is for those who like to live on dangerously on the end. You can have it automatically update firewalls, ACLs, switches. Oh, I sound, see someone new join the thing. I don't have a traditional NAT complex. Um, go ahead and tell it to disable the switch port. Cool, exec, da 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 da, wrote this cool little script, done. You're able to do that with this new logging complex. Notify a user directly. Hey, somebody logged in from a new IP address and this looks weird or it's not from within the US or whatever country you're from. Hey, this is weird for them. Let me send that user an email and make it their responsibility to go, hey, security, something's up. Uh, I didn't log in. You don't have to monitor that all, and you can start using your logging complex to generate those kind of alerts directly to your users. <sighs> Obviously, notify for admin logins, both on an internal and external side. One of the greatest things pen testers will talk about is like, oh, I got admin on all these systems. Oh, yeah, I crawled across the environment. Why aren't we logging and detecting that? A lo admin shouldn't be logging in remotely typically, and why not generate events for people to follow up on them? And then obviously for user logins on new machines, hey, Jim doesn't normally log in this machine and I haven't seen this before, I'm gonna generate an event. And this is easy to do then with these filters, with these custom outputs that some other logging complexes don't support. So again, we've got the monitoring, we've got the collection, we've got the storage. Um, what about the searching? That's one of the biggest problems with traditional syslogs is that you have to run grep, awk, run through this text file, wait, 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 go out through 10 gigs, come on, give me something. So since it's based on Elasticsearch, the, the crew over Elasticsearch is complex, has this pretty little front end called Kibana. Kibana pretty much looks like every other logging searching thing you can ever imagine. Uh, and you're able to quickly search for the events, correlate the events, and go through there. I'm not gonna go too far into Kibana because you can create all these pretty custom dashboards, you can go through and have the pretty maps for the management as we were saying, your boss loves them. Do this for your boss to get a better job. Um, but no, I mean, or get a raise, sorry. But so this works great. But that's all the pretty dashboards. You can do all the searches. Really, like I said, we're focusing on the security side, getting those alerts, getting that notification. But you may be going, for those of you who know what Elasticsearch is, maybe going, dude, uh, Elasticsearch, really? Uh, that, that shit's kind of not, has any security controls whatsoever. Yeah, it does not have security controls whatsoever. You have to build them. So as I said, it's not an easy solution, but it's one that you can scale and customize greatly. Um, so Elasticsearch is made so that basically you can cluster with everything, multicast to figure out all the other peers, doesn't have authentication, just trusts everyone, gives everyone pseudo rights. Yeah, it's bad. Um, from a security perspective. But it's great from a data perspective. So we have to build in these security controls on top of that. We have to write an Nginx proxy in order to bind locally. Really simple config. Have to segment the stuff off on the network so it doesn't take a multicast everywhere else. Again, simple change. And you need to add, enable some logging on your Nginx front end that you're doing the proxy for, uh, again, for compliance reasons and for the tracking of that. Again, simple configs. But everyone who's like, oh, you can't use that because of security reasons, you just have to add a few additional controls. Now, from a performance side, you can tweak, obviously, a lot more when you build your own system. So you can take in a tweak if you're starting to scale up the size of your indexes. Sometimes, by default, Logstash and Elasticsearch do daily indexes. But if you start logging, I don't know, 200 gigs a day, a 200 gig index is kind of a bad thing. So you can start changing the size of your indexes to hourly, minutes, so on and so forth. You increase the number of workers in Logstash in order to parse that stuff faster. You can enable compression in Elasticsearch. And you can enable queuing for the network traffic coming in. And again, the whole point of this is so you can scale. You know, the traditional systems, you can't scale, you can't cluster, it's not fault tolerant. You can easily scale up with Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana by spinning up more instances of Elasticsearch spinning out more instances of Logstash. And as I was saying, putting more steps in front of it that can kind of distribute and spin it out and they recommend Redis works well if you put Logstash in front of Logstash. I know it doesn't make sense, but it does. And so the question you all have is, is it as good or better than a vendor? You're up here preaching, you should look at open source stuff and you should take and do something different than just buy a product. Is it better? It's your call. I mean, if you have the technical ability or the team who has the technical ability or coworkers, um, uh, yeah, it, it works well and it doesn't come at the licensure cost of other things, but it's not easy to manage as a paid solution. It's still very relatively young, 
So there may be bugs you encounter. So if you're sitting there with critical logs as you cannot lose it all, you may want to look at someone who's a little more established or like I was saying, add a few steps in there to send it off to multiple storage locations. And it lacks authentication out of the box. Again, something you can easily change, but you'll hear people shaking their stick at that saying you've got to be able to authenticate to it. Nginx proxy, HTTP password, done. But on the flip side, it's extremely customizable, the price is just right, and some enterprise support is available. And you can even use it in the cloud. Oh, I had to wet my whistle there. So what's next? I just rambled here about how great this thing is, what's next? Um, we have this little thing as much as, okay, I'm ready for the boo and the hiss, but um, we call it the open PCI project. The domain hack PCI also works for some reason. I don't know why. But um, basically the idea of that, there shouldn't be any secrets as to how to secure stuff. You know, people have been selling this whole magic bean of, oh, we can give you these configs and keep reselling them. They're configs, guys. Like, we can share that information. It doesn't provide any kind of competitive advantage. And in fact, it just makes things easier for all of us. So we have this thing called the Open PCI project. Um, it needs an update for all this stuff, but I will get that soon, um, as soon as possible. But basically, to take and share this information, and we'll take and share all the configs, the base parsing, uh, a VM that's ready to go that you can just spin up right away. And obviously the hardening guides, as I was saying, Elasticsearch insecure by default, some hardening guides and configs are just here, Paceless Nginx config, it works, great, awesome. To make it as close as similar to these large commercial products, but obviously you need a little more hands-on support. So with that, I'm ending a little bit early, I'm sorry, but I'll get you, let you guys get in line for the next talks here. But that's me, that's the talk about all that stuff and all in all log stuff. Uh, fuck companies that sue people for, or legal pressure for giving talks about stuff they don't want and that's it. Thanks all. <laughs>